Good evening, and welcome to Restored Lore, your home for old, odd, and obscure stories on YouTube. Tonight's story is The House of the Seven Heads by Adrian Shada von Westrum. The story was translated into English by Alice Ballard MacDonald and published in Short Stories magazine in 1891. To avoid any confusion, this story is actually about the house with the heads. It's one of the local legends of Amsterdam about a notable house with six head ornaments on the facade. The House of the Seven Heads is a different local legend of Malaga. I don't know how the names or the story titles got confused, or if perhaps von Westrum just thought that Seven Heads sounded better, but here we are. Now, let's open our imaginations and begin. It stands on the Kaiserskracht, a gray and gloomy pile of nondescript architecture with seven horrible, fantastic heads carved on its grim, mold-covered stone facade. Generations ago, it was the property and the residence of a retired East India merchant who had amassed almost fabulous wealth and who lived in it in the unostentatious and solid style particular to the prosperous bourgeoisie of Amsterdam. It was the custom of this good gentleman to leave his city home early in the season for his country seat in the Harlem Armeer, and during his absence the house on the Kaiserskracht was left in the charge of an old servant, Anne, who belonged to a class fast dying out in Holland, if not already a feature of its past, and which has no parallel unless in that other extinct type, the Da of the Louisiana Creole life. This faithful woman had nursed the master through earliest infancy, and, according to the old custom, she remained in his service after his marriage, attending his young wife and caring for his children in turn. When wife and children had passed away, the responsibilities of the household rested entirely on the willing shoulders of the loyal Anne, and she comforted her master in his days of sorrow, guarded his interests, knowing no others, as her own, and devoted her age as she had given her youth to his service. The other servants came beneath her control, but in the summer she sent them away to the country house, preferring the peace and quiet of the deserted home to their troublesome society, and undertaking the task of the annual September house-cleaning entirely without assistance. She dearly loved every nook and corner of this old house where her master and his dear dead children had first seen the light of the world, and where the poor little ones had one after another closed their eyes upon it forever. She wanted no frivolous maids tripping about among the rooms, bothering her under the guise of assistance. It was a labor of love to get everything in readiness for the return of the master, and she grudged neither time nor strength in the waxing of the floors until one could easily break one's neck with an unsteady move on the slippery surface, in polishing the old brass until it showed one's face as in a mirror, and in carefully dusting and rearranging the quaint old Delft and Dalton, which, together with many a heathenish curio from the strange countries to which her master had journeyed, lined the shelves of cabinets and adorned the tops of the presses and chests. Some of these curios represented great wealth, so Anne had heard the master say, were even as valuable and to be guarded as carefully as the treasures of plate and gold and silver which were locked in the metal press in the library, and the hiding place of which was known in the household only to Anne and the master. But she did not think much of the poor grotesque things in her secret heart, these shabby old weapons crossed here on the wall, for example, very poor and clumsy things they looked to be. She carefully wiped the scabbard of one long, curving sword and then unsheathed the blade. <gasps> Dear heaven, but it was rusty. Only after a vigorous pull could she drag it from the sheath. Why not rub it up a bit? She was very tired, and this was really an unnecessary added exertion. But Anne hated rust almost as much as she hated dust, and it was such a satisfaction to feel that everything, even these ridiculous swords and their scabbards, were shining with cleanliness. So she set about the task, and in half an hour it was an accomplished fact. With a sigh of pure satisfaction at the consciousness of duty fulfilled, the old servant gave a glance about the handsome, comfortable room. It was her master's favorite room, 
his library, and it contained many a treasure of literature and art beside the yet more substantial treasure locked in the metal-bound press in the corner. Now I begin to feel the need of a good cup of tea, said Anne to herself. And I must get my wood up from the cellar for the morning. Oh, yes, she added, the shutters. She advanced toward the window and was about to close the shutters when a furious gust of wind flung them violently in place. A storm had been threatening all the afternoon. The wind was sweeping across the canal, the sky was black, the rain beat down with sudden fierceness, and as she closed the last blind at the front of the house, Anne saw the figures of two men huddled against the high stoop, apparently seeking shelter from the rising storm. In the old Dutch houses, the cellar, or rather an extension of it, is out beneath the high stoop and receives light from a small, square aperture cut in the stone. This opening also permits a current of air from the windows of the main cellar, which are larger, also square, and cut into the wall a few inches above the street. These windows were protected by light shutters. The opening in the front wall was left unprotected, for the stout door at the head of the cellar steps was provided with bolts and bars, and considered a sufficient defense against possible visitors who chose to enter the house by way of the cellar. Anne placed her candle on the steps, closed the shutters to keep out the driving rain, and busied herself first in collecting the firewood strewn over the floor of the cellar. This led her gradually toward the extension, and, with a sudden lull in the storm, she distinctly heard the sound of voices in subdued conversation. Advancing noiselessly, she peered through the opening in the wall. The two men who had sought comparative shelter from the storm were still huddled against the porch. Anne could not see their faces, she was too far below them, but what they said was perfectly audible, and, while she was puzzling over a certain familiar tone in the voice of one of the men, the import of his words fell with a chilling force which crushed in her every other thought. "'It could be managed without the slightest difficulty,' he said. "'The old woman is alone in the house, and we can step in here, one after the other.' He indicated the opening near which they stood with a motion of his foot. Anne could have touched it by stretching out her hand. She trembled violently with fear and was obliged to grasp the stone ledge of the window for support. "'All oh, very good,' whispered the second voice. "'But if, as you say, there's a strong door at the top of the cellar steps, how are we to get into the main house, after all?' "'How?' said the first speaker. There will be seven of us in all. We shall have the necessary implements. We shall break through the door. And while we're doing all this, whispered the other excitedly, what is to prevent the old woman from hearing us, from giving the alarm, from handing us into custody? And then what of all this great treasure? From that matter, how do you know that anything has been left in the house? His companion interrupted him with a contemptuous laugh. <laughs> One question at a time, my friend, he began coolly, and again Anne recognized something strangely familiar in the soft, sneering voice. If, as you say, the old woman hears us at work and cries out, who will hear her in the Kaiser's Kraft when all of Amsterdam will crawl indoor? How long, too, do you think it will take seven men and a strong axe to cut through a few bolts? Pa! One, two taps, and it is done. A third tap for the old woman, who will doubtless be standing ready to take it, and so much the better, since dead women, like dead men, tell no tales. Again he laughed disagreeably. As for the treasure, I know the house and the ways of the people, and you will kindly remember that I do not often bungle in these little affairs. However, he added carelessly, if you are timid, there are still six of us, and should you leave us in the lurch, you will at least keep our secret. Of that, I am quite sure. He spoke with a peculiar emphasis. The other rejoined instantly, Enough! I will be one of you. Now, you wish me to remain here and watch while you go in search of the others? Give me your plan now. It will save time and talk. Anne clung desperately to the sill, in spite of her shaking limbs which threatened to no longer support her weight. 
She was dazed, confused by the revelation of this horrible plan of robbery and murder. Yes, her murder. That was what they were plotting to accomplish. Dear heaven, what could she do? At least she must not lose a word. Do not leave this spot until I return. Should the old servant leave the house, strangle her from behind. Anne, with difficulty, repressed a cry of agony. I will bring the others as near the house as I dare and imitate the howl of a dog. If everything is quiet and we can approach, you repeat the sound. If you are silent, I shall know that the unexpected has happened. We understand each other thoroughly now? One thing more, as I said before, this window, tapping the wall behind him again with his foot, is better than the others. It has no shutters and will necessitate less noise near the street. It is just wide enough to admit a man head first and is not more than three feet from the floor. One can feel for the ground with his hands and so draw in the rest of the body. You had best enter first, I last, so we keep a watch on the others. Give a low cuckoo when you are safely on your feet within. I shall tell the others to do the same. So, I go now to the Rue de Lou, where the others are waiting, and we will return as soon as is possible to do so with safety. Thank God for the black night. We can begin our work early. He moved away, Anne intently watching. Wait, called the others softly. A dim shape rose again close beside the window. You are sure about the treasure? Come now, there's enough for seven? I a man, was the reply. And for eight, we shall need a man without to give an alarm if necessary. I tell you, there is not only money, but a service of solid gold and another of silver. In better days, I have eaten off both. He was gone. Anne, unable longer to stand, sank despairingly to the ground. She was conscious of the darkness, for the candle end she had brought into the cellar had long ago burned itself out on the stone steps. She covered her face with her hard old hands, and a few heavy tears crept through the knotted fingers. She had lived an honest life. She had served her master faithfully. She had hoped to close her eyes peacefully, at last, in his service. To die tonight, to be murdered, struck down with an axe beneath this very roof where she had spent nearly her whole life, or strangled from behind should she try to escape from the house? Horrible! Horrible! Would the dear God let such a thing be? She had suddenly a stupid sensation of being another than herself. The rain beat fiercely down. The wind sobbed and moaned about the house, then tore madly over the canal, lashing the placid waters to fury. A bell in the town tolled ten strokes, muffled and irregular through the noises of the storm. Ten o'clock. So late. Anne struggled to her feet. What was she doing here, weeping, inactive, when her life was at stake? Surely there was some way to prevent this awful, needless crime. This man without, watching, waiting to strangle her? He could not see in all directions at once. They had not counted on their plan being overheard. They would not expect strategy from her. There were the windows at the back of the house. She could drop from one of them and, by making a long detour, reach a neighbor or even the watch in the town. There was a chance of her meeting the other wretches, but it was one in twenty. Here in the house, she had no chance at all. Dear heaven! He was right, the villain. How long would it take seven men and a strong axe to break down a few bolts? She had no time to lose. She crept through the darkness straight to the cellar steps. She knew every inch of the ground, made her way softly to the door above, opening it as cautiously as though a sound might steal through stone walls and wooden shutters to the wicked ears without. In the kitchen, she lighted a candle, and, shading it with her hand as she passed before the windows, she moved quickly toward the dining room at the back of the house, and the windows of which were consequently furthest removed from the watcher on the Kaiser's craft. At the door of the library, she paused. Obeying an irresistible impulse, she entered the room, and, placing the candle on a small table, she looked about her. There was her master's favorite chair, drawn before his writing table, his books, his pictures, 
the pictures of his children and his wife. The curious ornaments on the shelves, in niches on the wall, everything dearest to him was in the room, yes, and everything of most value. Anne's eye fell on the metal-bound chest in the corner. Within were the two services of plate, gold and silver, heirlooms in the family, and more precious in the eyes of her master than the rolls of bills and sacks of coins and the cases of jewels stored beside them. She wondered, vaguely, in the midst of her strong excitement, how this hiding place, as well as the house itself, had become so well known to the robber with the strangely familiar voice. Alas, in an hour's time, perhaps in less, all this would have passed into his hands. This dear room, almost sacred to her, would be desecrated by the presence of those murderous ruffians, and she, the faithful one, who loved the belongings of her master as she loved him, would be flying along the Kaiserschacht, flying for her life. What? She would then be running away for her life? Yes, to be sure. A doubt, perplexing, agonizing, crept upon the old servant, slowly at first, assumed strength in her thoughts, merging at last into the certainty of a forceful conviction. Her place was here, here, to defend what had been given into her charge. How? It mattered not. With her life, if need be, this were better than the abandonment of duty. A certain exultation following upon this righteous resolve seemed to deprive even the certainty of the terrible death which was fast stealing upon her of all of its bitterness. They would find her here, in this room, the dear master and his servants. They would find her dead, murdered, beside the press, cut down at her post of duty. The master would shed tears at this affecting sight, and he would know that she had been faithful unto death. Yes, she would be faithful tonight, as through all the past, to him and to what was his. She looked again about the room in which she now knew she was to die. Her eyes lingered lovingly on each familiar feature of its furnishings. They rested on the swords she had been cleaning that evening, the last duty she would ever perform in this house which had so long been her charge. No, not the last. One was still to come. She moved slowly toward the weapons and laid her hand on one of them, a great broad sword with a blade as thick as an axe. Moved by some strange influence, Anne unsheathed the weapon, clutched it firmly with both hands, turning it slightly so that the dim light from the candle played on the dazzling steel. A single dull note sounded from the town bell. Half past ten. Perhaps even now her fate was creeping upon her stealthily along the Kaiser's craft. Remembering the signal, she listened intently for the howling of a dog, but no sound came to her save the moaning of the wind and the beating of the rain. Suppose the cry was lost in the storm, and that at this moment a head was being thrust through the cellar window and a pair of murderous hands reaching for the ground. Her own hands closed nervously on the weapon in her grasp, and unconsciously she lifted it as if to strike a blow. The action was suggestive. A host of thoughts crowded swiftly upon it, but thoughts so terrifying that the old servant, after abandoning herself to them for one delirious instant, fell suddenly on her knees and prayed God to snatch them from her heart. But they pressed in upon even her prayer. And yet upon her knees, with eyes upraised to heaven, she found herself plotting, planning to foil these cowardly robbers with their own weapons. How she might, with this good sword in her hand, station herself by the little window in the cellar. How each man would enter alone, offering his head, as it were, for the blow. The cry was known to her. Why was she praying to God to help her resist this voice in her heart, since he himself must have bidden it speak? Was it not right to defend one's life, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, and, strongest conviction of all, in this way alone could she risk her life to some purpose? Should she succeed, the treasure was safe. Here, on the contrary, of what avail the sacrifice of her life, since the robbers would step over her dead body to rifle the safe of its contents? My God, 
have mercy upon me, whispered the old servant, struggling to her feet and seizing the weapons which had fallen to the floor at her side. She took the candle in the other hand, placing first a few matches on the edge of the candlestick and closing the library door softly. She swiftly made her way to the cellar steps. Here, she extinguished the light and removed her shoes. Descending the steps without haste, she moved toward the extension, listening intently for the howling of a dog above the confusion of the storm. She had not long to wait. As the instigator of the robbery had said, the elements, wild and wicked, lent their aid to the furtherance of the evil deed. Anne laid her formidable weapon on the ground convenient to her hand and fell upon her knees. Again, the horror of what she was about to do closed in upon her senses. Thou shalt not kill. The words rang in her ears and were graven in flaming letters in the darkness about her. She was intensely, almost superstitiously religious. But perhaps the fanaticism to which her nature was prone found its greatest expression in her idolatry of her master and the fetish-like reverence with which she worshipped even his smallest belongings. The struggle between these two passions of a long, narrow life was sharp and severe, but it was also short. The words of the simple prayer, My God, pity me! My God, show me what is right! repeated again and again, died away suddenly in the old servant's throat. The prolonged howl of a dog sounded above wind and rain. In a moment, it was answered by another, much nearer the house. With the necessity for immediate action came the requisite courage. There was no further need of prayer, as there was no further hesitation. Muffled, stealthy footsteps approached the house. Not a word was spoken that could be overheard by the woman, who stood rigid with upraised arms, ready to deal the fatal strokes, with burning eyes fixed upon the shadowy opening in the wall, so faintly outlined against the darkness of the night. But her eyes, grown accustomed to the surroundings, saw plainly the rounder, darker outline of the man's head, which was thrust cautiously forward through the opening, saw even where the line of hair ended sharply against the back of the neck, saw by some second sense of sight where the shoulders followed the head, and the arms were drawn slowly in, one after another, and were extended downward to reach the ground. Now! The terrible blade descended swiftly, silently, on that spot below the line of hair. There was a vibrant shock, a slight resistance, then it went on, cleaving through a life. The head fell with a heavy, sickening sound, prolonged by a soft gurgling. And all this with such hideous speed, such appalling silence. The woman's head swam, and she staggered as she moved a step or two nearer to seize the headless body by the feet and drag it through the window. Then she must stoop and push it aside for the next. And the signal. She had almost forgotten. Dear God, where was her voice? She made a fearful effort, but the voice, rough, husky, yet harsh, could it be hers? Cuckoo! She shivered with anxiety. Would they detect the strangeness of the voice? Suspect a trap? Fly? Oh, if God would have it so. Suppose, indeed, he did not sanction this awful bloodshed. Was not this murder? And murder deliberately planned, and not one victim, but seven. The prayer rose again to heaven, this time voiceless, but the same poor words went up from the tortured soul. My God, pity me. Show me what is right. A second head, a second blow to sever it from its body. After a pause, as before, to gain the same advantage, only this time an added horror, since the falling head rolled between her feet, and, when afraid to risk a misstep, she stooped to push it aside with her hands, they touched the hair and beard, wet and warm with blood. Its sickening odor remained upon them, and, shaking as with ague, yet with the heat of fever in her brain, Anne dragged the second body after the first, and, as it was that of a slight man, her strong arm lifted it from the ground and flung it far back into the cellar. 
This time she gave the signal in a clearer voice, and as she again took her position to wait for the third victim, she was conscious of a certain lightness, a vague exhilaration, which she could not have analyzed had she tried. Her lips still moved in silent prayer, but unconsciously to herself, the words of her supplication had changed, and she entreated only for strength. Yes, strength to kill. The third man came quietly to his fate, as had the two before him, but with the fourth it was different. He had followed closely on his companion, and Anne had not time to push aside the preceding body before aiming a blow at his neck. His hands, feeling for the floor, came in contact with the gaping throat from which the blood still streamed and passed swiftly over it to the lifeless arms and shoulders. What, what is this? he muttered. Where are you? Receiving no reply, he tried vainly to wriggle back as he had come through the narrow opening from which he dangled head downward. But his struggle was short, and his fate differed from that of his companions, only in that his upraised head met the descending sword, which crashed through his skull, cleaving it and striking only one half from the body. There was no indecision, no fear, no remorse in the action of the woman who seized the limp figure and drew it in through the window with one vigorous movement of her steady arm. There was no hesitation in the rough voice which gave the cry to which the fifth robber responded. Into the limbs, stiffened by years of labor, a new strength was creeping. The thin blood of age was leaping and dancing like the hot torrent which courses through the veins of youth, urging it to desperate acts of heroism or of evil. The wrinkled face of the old servant grew flushed and eager, her dim eyes sparkled. The smell of blood was in her nostrils, and they quivered like those of a wild beast. Her thin lips parted over the toothless gums in a smile of hideous cruelty. The lust of murder was upon her. The sixth head fell with its horrible, heavy sound beneath a terrific blow from the avenging sword, and angrily, as one impatient of delay, Anne snatched the body of the man roughly by the belt and flung it violently behind her. Cuckoo! she cried at the window, and her voice was like the growl of an enraged brute. This time, the head put through the window was instantly withdrawn, and a murmur of hushed voices ensued. The woman within stamped on the ground in her impatience. She thrust her foot forward. It touched some soft, heavy object, the headless body of a man. She kicked it furiously. Then, as the murmuring continued and the delay waxed longer, she became possessed of rage and fell to hacking with the sword in her hand in all directions, to the right, to the left, wherever she thought a body lay. Wait, suppose it might be heard from without. Anne paused in this drunken carnival of blood, sobered by the fear that the seventh victim might escape her. She turned again to the window. The voices had ceased. A head was thrust through the opening. Are you all there? whispered a cautious voice. Is everything all right? The woman with the uplifted sword feared to answer, thinking her voice so near him might betray her. She had grown cunning in even the short madness that had come upon her. She bent forward with incredible swiftness, and before the head could be withdrawn, she had seized it firmly by the hair. The man uttered a stifled oath and struggled to free himself. He may as well have battled with an avalanche. The crazed creature twisted her hard fingers in and out of his hair, dragging his head down inch by inch, and so holding him as a child might hold a doll with one hand, she swung her weapon high in the air and struck off his head with the other. But the body, overweighted on the outer side of the sill, fell headless into the street. A shriek of horror rose from the almost paralyzed watcher on the Kaiser's Kracht. It was answered by a howl of triumph from the frantic and blood-stained woman within. Seven! Seven! she screamed. Seven heads, and they are mine! All of them mine! The man fled for his life. The sound of his flying steps came dimly, ceased altogether. The storm had died, and suddenly the moon came out, shone down on the waters of the canal, turgid and troubled, on the dripping trees and the river of mud running along the Kaisersgracht, looked in at the unshuttered windows of the cellar and flooded it with light. 
There lay a heap of headless bodies, with the blood streaming from their necks and from a dozen gaping wounds dealt by some weapon and with terrific force. Seven heads, all with wide-opened eyes, in which a vague presentiment of terror seemed dawning, all save one, and that was but half a head, smitten from its other half, which might be found clinging to the limp neck of a disfigured body. This, too, the moon saw, a little mad old woman, laughing, chattering, crying to herself, who stared about her with unseeing eyes when first the moon looked in, and then suddenly seeing all gave way to frenzy, cast herself on the ground in the midst of the ghastly company, striking at and biting whatever she touched, shrieking with horrible laughter as the heads rolled about beneath her furious blows, and all this was so pitiful to see that after a little while the moon hid her face behind the clouds and the night was black until the gray fingers of the dawn lifted the curtain of the day. The morning watch on the Kaiser's Grot was horrified to find the headless body of a man stretched before the door of one of the wealthiest residents. And, while stooping to examine it, a peal of hideous laughter rang in his ear. Turning his head swiftly, a grinning, blood-stained face stared at him from the cellar window. The eyes were bright and cunning, the lips parted in an unmeaning smile over toothless gums. With a cry of alarm, the good officer put a safe distance between himself and a wrinkled, bloody paw that was stretched forth to seize him, and, with a growl of rage, the face at the window disappeared. The guardian of the peace, greatly puzzled and disturbed, was about to hurry to the town to seek assistance in unraveling the mystery when a heavy traveling carriage rolled into view and he recognized the equipage of the owner of the house. He waited its approach and when it stopped before the door which covered this unknown tragedy, he advanced quickly to meet its occupant. With a brief word of explanation, he pointed out the corpse stretched before the house, and at the same moment, attracted by the sound of the wheels, Anne's scarcely recognizable face appeared at the cellar window. At the sight of her master, who stared at her with an expression of mingled wonderment and horror, she gave a bitter, incoherent cry, and great tears forced themselves from her eyes, mingling with the blood which bespattered her face, formed two red and muddy rivulets which ran heavily down the furrows of her cheeks. And, great God, exclaimed the master. Then, suddenly regaining his self-control, he turned angrily to his servants, who had huddled behind him. What are you doing standing there? Why do you not open the doors? Come, get out your keys. But in spite of his firm and angry tones, he shuddered as his gaze fell on the ghastly corpse before his door and the poor distorted face which looked out above it. The officer, ashamed to betray hesitation, followed the owner into the house and accompanied him to the cellar. The sickening spectacle unnerved both men. But when the poor, mad creature came creeping, like a faithful dog, over the blood-stained floor, past the mutilated bodies, to kneel at the feet of her beloved master, the pompous, self-contained old merchant broke into weeping and sobbed like a child. It was many days before the lucid interval which came just before the death of the old servant permitted her to tell the whole terrible story. In her fevered ravings, she had betrayed her sufferings little by little, but toward the last the delirium left her, and at the close of one bright fall day, when the rays of the setting sun lay across her bed, she opened her faded eyes, clear at last of the terrible hallucination which had possessed her mind ever since that awful night. Her master was summoned and stood beside her with her faithful hands in his, while hurriedly, all unconscious of her heroism, she told him at what price she had saved that which he had entrusted to her care. The end came that night. And so, in grateful commemoration, the grim stone façade of the house on the Kaiserskracht were carved the seven heads of the men who were slain in self-defense and in the protection of another's property, by the hand of a single woman. Yes, although one of them was the own nephew of the owner of the house, and had many times been made welcome beneath its roof, he too, with the rest, was copied in death, and perpetuated in stone to the memory of a faithful servant. And all Amsterdam knows the story.
The best sentence in this story is, The struggle between these two passions of a long, narrow life was sharp and severe, but it was also short. Once she chooses violence, she is in, and boy is she, filled with bloodlust and madness and hacking at the dead bodies like the final girl in a slasher movie. (laughs) As I mentioned at the beginning, this story is based on a pretty weird local legend in Amsterdam, but more on that in a minute. The legend doesn't really consist of more than a couple of sentences. The heads on that building are the heads of robbers who were killed by a kitchen maid as they tried one by one to enter the building. So in writing this piece, Van Westrom had to build that little idea out into a complete story, and he does this by delving deep into the habits, thoughts, and beliefs of this maid, really psychologically examining her and the impulses that drove her to this extremity. It's basically what Stephen King does, you know, kind of mining the subconscious for horror. The writing style is a bit like Jane Austen in that we slip in and out of Anne's mind and her thoughts and her perspective without formally changing the narrator voice. But of course, the most horrible image in the whole story isn't any of the violence that occurs in the cellar. It's the terrible blood-strained gibbering face and clutching hands at the little window the next morning. God, no wonder the policeman didn't want any part of that. So now let's talk briefly about where history and myth overlap in this story. The house with the heads is on Kaiserskracht in Amsterdam. It's a real house built in 1622 for Nicholas Sohir. Wikipedia says that he was a stock trader. He was not. Uh, This story says he was an East Indian merchant. He was not. He was a stocking dealer. He made and sold hosiery. And he must have been spectacularly successful. When the city of Amsterdam was expanded and these new large building lots were opened up on Kaiserskracht, he bought a huge lot and he built a huge house, part of which was actually his stocking factory. He was a noted art and antiquities collector and a connoisseur of Venetian music. Um, To this day, you can actually look up the inventory of the paintings that were in his collection. So here's wife and two daughters did die shortly after he moved into the house. In 1634, after just 12 years, Sohir sold the house on Kaiserskracht to industrialist Louis de Geer, and the de Geer family owned it until 1799. Sohir moved to a new house on Herengracht, Both of those houses are actually Rijks monuments, and they are still standing today. By the way, they're not grim, moldering stone edifices as described in the first paragraph of the story. It's a very attractive house. It was de Geer who actually put the famous six heads on the facade of the house on Kaiserskracht because he wanted to celebrate trade, science, philosophy, culture, etc. And in that respect, it's one of the weirdest aspects of the story. The heads on the building are actually the heads of six Roman gods, Apollo, Ceres, Mercury, Minerva, Bacchus, and Diana. And they have all their trimmings, right? As you can see in this picture, Apollo has the laurel wreath, Bacchus has the grapes, and so on. These are in no way the terrible moldering heads of would-be robbers and murderers, and they never were. I mean, obviously the facade has been maintained and restored at different points in the past 400 years, and maybe the original heads did look more grim, but this house has also been depicted in art and photography for literally hundreds of years, including pictures of a pretty significant restoration in 1860, and they always look like Roman gods to me. However, I actually kind of like it. It feels very human to me to mix fact and fiction and tell a scary story so that everyone in the neighborhood shudders when they walk by a certain house. It makes Amsterdam feel smaller to me and, and, and older when I think of these kinds of community stories. Interestingly, the house may have also acquired a reputation because Suhir's wife and daughters did die there. He only lived there for 12 years after going to considerable expense to have it designed and built. And then it seems like de Geer's wife died there, giving birth to their 16th child, by the way, and he only lived there for four years before going back to Sweden, although the house did remain in the family. Of course, childbirth was much more dangerous back then, so perhaps these two family tragedies would have been more common, but perhaps having them in the same place in such a short period of time may have made the neighbors talk, 
not about the heads on the facade, but perhaps it may have given the house a kind of ominous reputation back in the 1600s, which would have proved fertile ground for this type of story to grow. As I mentioned, if you Google a house with the seven heads, you find a different but equally terrible legend from Malaga in Spain. And you also find the Well of the Seven Heads in Scotland, which also has a macabre story attached. Likewise, if you Google Haus mit der Hoofden in Nederlands, there are a bunch of famous houses decorated with heads all over the country, but they are, of course, decorations. Perhaps someday we'll look into the dark stories of other architecture that features heads. <laughs> or perhaps seven heads are like seven hills and just about everybody has them. If you listen all the way to the end of the video, you get to hear me make a little confession. Tonight's confession is that my first sight of Amsterdam back in 2012 made me feel like such a fool. For some reason, I, and I think a lot of Americans are the same way, had just a very vague impression of the Netherlands in general and Amsterdam in particular. You know, something something red light and drugs and tulips and wooden shoes and Anne Frank... I didn't have any particular mental image of the city or its landmarks or its landscape. I don't think I'd ever ever seen a postcard, and I don't think I ever heard anyone talk about visiting Amsterdam the way people I knew talked about Paris or London or Rome or Barcelona. So the first time I stepped out of Amsterdam Central and got a look at the city, I was just blown away. It is so, so beautiful and complex and interesting. It is truly a world-class city, but for some reason it seems kind of off the radar for people who are interested in culture and architecture and beauty and history. I was lucky enough to live in Amsterdam for a year or so, and it just continued to delight and fascinate me. And in recent years, of course, Amsterdam is working hard to remarket itself. They understandably want to attract fewer visitors and a different kind of visitor, and I don't blame them. Lots of European cities are trying to do the same thing. They want tourists who are, you know, respectful. And that means really rethinking your whole tourism industry and how it works and how it relates to the rest of the economy. I also think that a lot of that kind of work, frankly, begins at home. People need to stop thinking of their vacations as an excuse to act like a fool. Or they need to go places that are specifically set up for that, like Florida or Las Vegas. Anyway, if you're interested in art and culture and history and you want an amazing European experience, but you still want to speak English and eat familiar foods, I highly recommend Amsterdam. And then you can walk by the house with the heads and get a look at it yourself. If you are interested in local legends and spooky stories, you should subscribe to this channel. At Restored Lore, I bring you old and interesting stories from around the world, and you wouldn't want to miss anything. Please also uh, like this video, share it if you think someone would like it, and drop me a comment below. It really does help other people find the channel. Thank you so much for the support, and I will see you in a few days.